Hello and welcome to Inside Music, episode number 130. I'm your host, James Shotwell, and it's great to be with you again. This episode is almost a sequel to last week's episode, and by that, I mean that our two guests are connected. If you recall, in episode 129, we spoke with John O'Donnell about his new charitable effort, Hope, a comic for Flint. This week's guest, Sam Moore of the band Cope Niconic, is one of the contributors to that publication. Now, Sam's on the show to tell us a little bit more about Hope, as well as the charitable organization that the, magazine, that the comic book is hoping to support. After that, Sam and I talk a lot about his band Cope Niconic, their fuzzed-out take on indie rock, and what the future holds for their band. Now, I'm sure there are a lot of you listening to this who have seen some of the bigger name guests that we've had on the show, and you might not have heard the name Cope Niconic before, but let me tell you, they're worth your time. Obviously, we're going to use a little bit of their music in this episode, but altogether, they're a band that has really taken my world by storm. I had never heard of the group or Sam until about two weeks ago when I was in Flint recording what we now refer to as the Lost episode of Inside Music. Jono introduced me to Sam and told me about his band, who I then later listened to on my way home. I discovered that the group's debut full-length album, Generation Parasite, was on Spotify, and I immediately took to it. The opening track, Trash, is a catchy little pop rock song that has a huge hook that's easy to remember and a lot of quirky but very grounded lyricism that is highly relatable to anyone kind of in the struggle right now. The song that really caught me, however, and the one that we're going to tease a little bit in today's episode, is called Clouds on Display. And we talk about it in the episode, so I don't want to get too much into how the song came together. But let me just tell you that there's a moment at the end of this song where the lyrics, the vocals drop out, and the music kind of swells into this fuzzed out, jubilant celebration of life. And it really just knocked me over sideways. The first time I heard it, I honestly had to pause the song, rewind to when that moment started, and listen not once, not twice, but five more times. And as soon as that was done... I texted Sam and asked him if he would be on the show. So he's here today, and we spend about 25 minutes talking about everything, from the comic book to his band to the differences and similarities between writing comic books and writing music. There's a lot here, and it happens really quickly. So before we get to the conversation, I want to tell you a couple of quick things, and then we'll get to the show. First off, this episode of Inside Music is brought to you by Holix, the music industry's leading digital promotional distribution platform. What that means is that Holix works with record labels, publicists, and independent artists from all over the world to discreetly share new and unreleased music without fear of piracy. To learn how they do this and gain access to a free 30-day trial, visit holix.com. That's H-A-U-L-I-X.com. I also want to encourage you to follow the podcast on Twitter, at Inside Music Pod or at Inside Music P-O-D. We post updates about upcoming guests as well as information related to life in the music industry. And finally, I need to plug that every episode of Inside Music is being added to YouTube as we speak. Our most recent episodes are already available there as well as a few fan favorites, but in the coming weeks, you will find every episode in our catalog available for streaming online anywhere music or videos are found. So without further ado, I'm going to play a little bit of Clouds on Display by Cope Niconic, and then we'll get to our conversation with Sam. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to rate and subscribe the show, and enjoy. Also, support that comic book. Here we go. because I we had just watched the first two the other day, me and a bunch of friends for the first time in I don't know how long. Uh, those movies sort of hold up still, I think. <laughs> yeah, you just watched the first two. You just watched uh, The Dirty and The Spy Who Shagged Me. Yes, so we did not get around to the third one. Yeah. Um, it was, it's, uh, it's okay. <laughs> I think that it's been a while since I've seen them, probably a couple of years now. But there are there are definitely moments that still work, like when he gets the uh, gets the cart stuck in the hallway and can't turn around. Like that. Oh yeah, that, that is great. That joke's gonna work forever. 
Uh, <laughs> well, that's good, man. What, sure. what led you to watch Austin Powers? Um, it was a friend of ours' birthday, and I I don't even remember exactly how we ended up deciding on that. Uh, he's just like a big fan of spy movies and espionage and all that stuff. So we're like, oh, well, you know, what's better than Austin Powers? <laughs> so we ended up doing that. I can't argue. I can't argue. Yeah. Uh, so, man, I want to talk to you about a couple of things, but let's talk about the most uh, the most recent pressing thing first. Jono was on the last episode of the show, and you are on this week's episode. And what is the one thing that ties the two of you together besides Flint and music and all that? What's what's the thing right now that ties the two of you guys together? Oh, the one thing would definitely be Hope, a comic for Flint. <laughs> so you have the last story in the comic book, and now Jono already told us about the anthology and stuff, but for people that don't really didn't hear the episode because, I don't know, they're idiots who didn't listen to the last episode. Can you give us the yeah. quick the quick rundown? The quick rundown on Hobo Comic Report? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, a number of months ago, um, John had been kicking around the idea of, you know, wanting to uh, get some people together to work on a comic book together and, you know, find um, a charity around here that we could put all the proceeds towards. So uh, he basically just kind of hit up um, myself and a number of other writers and artists um, that we're all kind of friends with uh, from around the area here. And we just teamed up and uh, paired off basically um, five pairs of people to do five stories, five pages long, and just compiled them all into one single issue and uh, ended up um, going with the Compass, which is a local charity around here that does work with adults with disabilities. So um, each of the stories in Hope, a Comic for Plant are centered around the theme of hope. Um, so all of them are wildly different stories, but they all kind of come back to this optimistic message. Yeah, and what's your, your story about specifically? You close the book out. It's kind of a big responsibility. Yeah, uh, so mine is about uh, two characters that are friends and decide to catch up and like grab a coffee uh, and just kind of see where they're at in life. And the uh, the conversation revolves around that whole feeling of, man, I thought I would be farther along in my career right now. I thought I would be doing more or I'd have done more or things would look different, um, which I think is something that a lot of us can relate to. Uh, the twist to my whole issue here is that both of these characters in my story are monsters. Uh, so they're villains and they're talking about how do they wish that they were um, better bad guys, basically. Uh, so like one of them wants to write books that like, suck the souls out of people if they read them and the other one like works in a dungeon and like fights off good guys trying to you know make their way through dungeons or whatever like typical kind of like low level video game bad guy stuff um and it's about them just kind of like debating on whether it's worth it to follow your dreams or not uh when things are difficult or when you're not seeing as much progress as you'd like so that's kind of the heart of it, is that, that debate of following your dreams. And it's a great story, man. It's one of my favorites in the book, which is weird to say because it's a charity thing, and I don't know that I should have favorites, but I do enjoy it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> um, now, you are actually, people have heard, we haven't actually released the raw audio from the what I'm just calling the lost episode in Flint, but you were there. You were there. Um, yeah. You and I have met before. Um, you guys just put on a show for the release of the comic book this past Saturday. Can you, how, how was that experience? Oh, man, it was awesome. Uh, we had a super good turnout. Um, uh, basically, so far, we have raised, I think, close to $2,000 um, for the Compass, which is awesome. We had a really, really good turnout, um, a lot of good feedback. Uh, I don't know. It was, it was great. I was still kind of like riding the high from that night honestly uh it was it was awesome and that was everyone on the bill was connected to the show uh to the comic book correct 
Uh, yeah. So uh, at least one member of each, each of the bands that played, which was the Dead Serious, the Apology Tour, Baggage, and then my band called Mechanic, uh, at least one person in each band worked on the comic in some way, whether they were a writer or an artist or, you know, did the cover or something. Everyone was involved in one way. Awesome, man. And do you guys have any further promo plan for the comic? I know you guys have been hitting it really hard recently with the promo train. So has it continued post-release or are you guys finally getting to catch your breath for a second? Um, catching our breath a little bit, but we're still going to be pushing it pretty hard. Um, actually, today, uh, this morning, um, Dono had just dropped off a bunch of copies at our local comic shop. So um, I think the plan is to just keep um, pushing the, the fact that we do have an online store for it if people are still interested and they didn't get to go to the release show, um, and then hopefully get some more local shops that are interested in carrying it. So we'll still be pushing it in the months to come. I think that um, this initial batch of copies that we have now and the ones that we've sold so far were, I guess, kind of like technically our own. Um, and then Source Point Press, who is the publisher that picked up the comic and is putting it out, um, all of their copies of the issue, I think, are coming in October or sometime this fall. So it's not that the, the wide release, I guess, is still a couple months out. But we're, we're pushing all the local stuff pretty hard right now and the online store as well. Yeah, I would imagine, especially here in Michigan, there are somehow a ton of locally owned comic book stores and bookstores. You guys could probably do quite a bit of kind of regional press in the coming weeks that way. Yeah, for sure. Well, I also yeah, want to talk... A, go ahead. There's a community for it. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Um, no, I just I also want to talk to you about your music. I mean, I, I brought you on the show. I do want to plug the comic book again. I told Jono that I was going to continue plugging it. But uh, when you and I met the first time, I hadn't actually heard your band before. Jono was just like, here's my friend Sam. I didn't know that you were in a band. And you are. It's called Cope Nikonic. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is, okay, let's start right there. I know that there is a, is it a Camp Cope Nikonic in Michigan or a Lake Cope Nikonic? What does the name come yes. from? Yes. Uh both of those are actually real. So, uh, let, I mean, just to rip the Band-Aid off, we have arguably the worst band name in the universe. Um, <laughs> I've, I've come to terms with that. You know, it's fine. It's whatever. Uh, but, yeah, it is, uh, it's a lake and a camp in Fenton, Michigan. Um, the funny thing about that is that, that we just picked the name, you know, a number of years ago, like before we even really had uh, – really formed the band, I guess. Uh, and two of the members in it lived over, you know, in that area, like kind of on the lake. Uh, neither of them are in the band anymore. So we are just kind of stuck with this theme that's super obscure. It's hard to spell. You know, only a handful of local people really even know that it's like a lake or something. It's it's all around pretty horrible band name so yeah it's awesome <laughs> i don't think it's a horrible band name whatsoever it just takes a second to okay, adjust to you. <laughs> once once you figure out once you figure out what you're saying it's a great band name um i can well, thank you. I, I contend it. the worst band name i've ever seen is there is a group in new york a few years ago who their name was vowels but they didn't write like when they put their name on flyers they just put a i o u and it was like there's, oh my god yeah wow. <laughs> and, you, and you were supposed to pronounce that as vowels and I was, that was the worst band name i'd ever seen <laughs> that is very confusing i mean you got to think that there's a good chunk of people that would like to discover that band or mm -hmm. go back and find them online after catching them at a show and they just are never able to i don't know yeah it's it was frustrating um, <laughs> <laughs> but tell me tell me a little bit about Cobra Conic. how i mean i don't i've only known you guys since i've met you and then I, I got in the car and i was listening to the record you put out last year generation paris site but how long have you guys been a band um we've been uh, a uh quote unquote real band i think for maybe three or four years now um where we were actually, you know, playing shows and had like a demo tape out or something. Um, we yeah, we put out our first full length last summer on Saver Generation Records, Generation Parasite. So that was like our first major release. We had done a couple 
um, EPs before that that we just put out on our own. Um, just kind of like garage recording stuff, nothing like super, you know, professional or high quality or anything. But yeah, I think it's been about three or four years. And are you guys on a label right now? Uh, yeah, Favorite Generation, they're uh, Michigan label here. It's uh, Sonny Pacheco, who uh, recently uh, propelled the very successful and awesome Hot Mulligan onto No Sleep Record. <laughs> yes, that is the source of Hot Mulligan. And actually, we're going to do an SYG Records episode of the podcast later this month. So you're kind of... Oh, nice. Yeah, you're kind of precipitating that in a little ways. Um Tell me about Generation Parasite. For no one that's ever heard Copenhagenic, like I have my idea of what you guys sound like, which is like a fuzzed out rock band that has like a little bit of punk tendencies, a little bit of indie tendencies. But how do you tell people about your band? Oh man, uh, yeah, I think that's I think that's pretty accurate. Um, I had we had someone uh, last fall when we played our first show out in New York. We had someone who like did like a, a review or a blog post or something about it afterwards, and they said that we sounded like uh, we could be in the soundtrack for Shameless. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that like does it uh, justice, but uh, yeah, very kind of like '90s influenced, uh, fuzzy kind of like catchy rock music, I guess. So, um, you know, like things like Weezer. We're big fans of, or like modern bands like um, Roswell Kid and Charlie Bliss and. Uh, Violin Soho and a lot of stuff like that. So yeah, big fuzzy chords and just kind of like catchy hooks and stuff to get stuck in your head. Lots of silly lyrics mixed with hopefully profound, serious ones. <laughs> when I uh, I like that description, something that could be in Shameless. It's almost like, and I, and I feel like this is also true for uh, a couple of the bands from Flint right now. It's it's almost like it's like struggle music. Like it's music for people caught in the struggle. Whatever whatever that struggle yeah, happens I'm to be. That. Yeah, yeah, because I feel like that's what they mean by shameless. It's like working class music. Um, yeah, yeah, there you go. Which is fine, which is fine. Um, I, it seems like if anyone knows the song by you guys, it's probably Trash, which is the album opener. That seems to be like the song people gravitate towards. Yeah, that was the first single we put out um, for the record, and that one's uh, done pretty well, so that's cool. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> definitely a, a, like a pop, you know, structure with a big catchy hook to it so i think it gets stuck in people's heads which is nice uh, you're you're so modest you're like that one's okay yeah that's a song <laughs> <laughs> you know okay so uh we've always been pretty like self-deprecating and stuff and i think we're only just now like a few years into our careers like coming around to the idea of being the tiniest bit confident in our work so yeah this is this is a big step. <laughs> well, I, I'm proud of you guys. You're you're a good band. I I, I get it though. It, Thank it, you. <laughs> it, it can be weird to be like, yeah, we're, that's 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 a really great song. I, I get that. But for you, is there a song on on that record, Generation Parasite, that you feel is maybe the best representation of what you think you guys do, or is there a track that like, if this is the song you play for somebody the first time you introduce them to your band? Um, if not trash, I would say probably the title track on there, Generation Parasite. Um, those are both kind of like, uh, I would say maybe two of the more catchy tracks on the record. Um, but lyrically also, they're just kind of about, you know, the weirdness of growing up and how difficult it can be. And, um, I kind of, I came up with the, the, phrase of Generation Parasite because I feel like uh, our generation kind of gets shit on a lot for, you know, being uh, entitled, you know, or lazy or whatever. So I just kind of like embraced it as like kind of a middle finger to all of that of just like, yeah, whatever, you know, we're parasites. Like, fine, you can call us that. You know, we don't care, you know. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, yeah. I was texting you this morning, but a song that really draws my attention on the record is Clouds on Display. Can you kind of tell me a little bit about that track and where it came from? Yeah. Um, so Clouds on Display, it's kind of like an oddball, I think, on that record, um, but in a good way, hopefully. Uh, 
I, to be honest with you, uh, Jesse, our singer, wrote all the lyrics for that one, and it is kind of um, vague, I guess, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but That's... the lyrics are um, hopefully not, like, too obtuse or anything, but people, I guess, do like that one. Uh, and that one kind of came together on the fly. Uh, we were at a point uh, last year when we were recording the record where I wanted to start pushing it more or getting more done in a faster time. So I just straight up put some money down on studio time and told Jesse and Kyle in the band, I was like, hey guys, guess what? Uh, we're going into the studio in a month, so we have to finish these songs and we don't have a choice anymore. And that was one of them that kind of came out where we just kind of had to light a fire under our own asses to uh, stay on track, I guess. So that one came together very quickly, um, which was cool, though, just to kind of get to jam out and make it all very organic, which typically we kind of do the other way around, which is, you know, someone brings a song to the band and we just kind of flush it out from there. Um, so yeah, that one, it's just kind of like a mishmash of a bunch of ideas we threw together fairly quickly. And I think it came out cool. Yeah. And I, and I think you can kind of tell a little bit about, about how the song was created because there is a moment and I, and I, this is something that I even texted you about the last, I don't know, 30 seconds of the song or so it gets kind of, it gets real jubilant and very fuzzed out and it, and it feels I guess it feels as close to what you might think the band is like in a live setting as you can get on like a studio record because it just feels loose and it feels like you're kind of in the moment in that time and it's like, ah, this is what it's all been building towards. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. Um, <laughs> you know, very, I get very big, you know, fuzzy uh, guitars and stuff. Yeah. yeah, definitely what we go for live, you know. We don't, none of us have particularly great gear. So we just try to make up for it by being loud and distorted. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> that, that method has worked for many an artist. <laughs> right. Uh, well, what are you guys working on right now? Because the album came out last year. Uh, the comic book's out now. So, like, what is going on? What is on Sam Moore's to-do list right now? Um, we are actually heading back into the studio in a couple weeks to record our next single, which is cool. Um, we have a whole bunch of other songs in the works. I think, I don't want to jump the gun here, but I think the goal is to compile them all into an EP uh, sometime in the near future, which will be really cool. Um, so yeah, just working on a bunch of new stuff for the band uh, and then pushing Hope for Comics to come some more. Uh, we do have a couple shows coming up that I am currently drawing a blank on the details, but we can definitely post about them on social media like every good band does. Yeah, uh, but yeah, you know, just working on working on the next batch of songs, which is cool because we haven't actually um, put out any new songs in a year now, so mm. it's exciting. Let me ask you this: between you know, you just finished this comic book project, and you ha you're working on new songs for the band. Is there one that you find more creatively fulfilling currently? Like, was did comics make you approach music differently? Like, tell me a little bit about, I guess, the similarities and the differences between those two creative processes. Yeah, you know, I think there is kind of, like, a, a pretty healthy overlap between, like, punk rock ethics and making comics. Uh, I think that whole mentality of just, like, anyone can do this, you know, overlaps pretty strongly with both of those, which is really cool, which, you know, made Hope a Comic for Flint possible in the first place. You know, just deciding, like, hey, we can do this, so we, we should. Um, but right now, uh, you know, I've been a huge comic book fan for like over a decade of my life now um so this is really really exciting to actually be able to hold a physical copy of like a published story uh that i worked on it's the coolest feeling so i do want to kind of run with that you know and like strike while the iron pot and work on some new drafts of stories and some scripts and stuff with comics just because it's like a totally new feeling for me to uh, you know, see like a story come together and then have it fleshed out with the art and everything. It's like magical, you know, it's awesome. Um, so that right now is super exciting for me, but also, you know, very excited for music as well. 
but the comic thing is awesome. I'm probably going to try to keep that going for a while if possible. In your mind, is the next Sam Moore comic book creation uh, another down-to-earth human story, or is it much more superpowers, mysticism kind of stuff? What 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 attracts you as a writer? Oh man, uh, as a writer, I love just doing really weird, uh, like strange, fun things. Um, so, like the comic that. Uh, I have in Hope of Comics with Flint, uh, you know, it's got monsters and stuff and just kind of cool, weird, fun things like that. Uh, totally, I guess, pretty, pretty close to uh, maybe like Adventure Time, you know, and, and things like that that are just very, very weird, but very, very fun and hopefully humorous and can manage to like strike a serious chord at the same time. Um, so for me, yeah, probably more, you know, monsters and weirdness and other dimensions and all of that, you know, just fun, weird, like, wacky comic book sort of stuff. Uh, I I don't think I'll mess around with superhero stuff on my own for a long time, just because I feel like it's hard to make those work when you don't have, like, the established, like, Marvel Universe and the DC Universe and stuff. I think it's really hard to make indie like small time superheroes click with people does that make sense absolutely because now it's if they don't belong to marvel or dc it's uh, there's a little bit of like what's the point because i mean we're we're, yeah. we're we're ingrained to like the idea of a universe of characters so if you're going to make one like you're setting up you're you're, you're kind of assuming that there's a whole world you're going to create it, it is like a huge it's, it yeah. seems like a much bigger undertaking yeah absolutely and I mean, just to clarify, too, like, I adore superhero stuff. Like, that is not me trying to come down on, you know, on, like, a mainstream superhero comics or anything like that. Like, I I eat that stuff up, you know. I just think, for me, I would rather mess around with other ideas and, uh, you know, play around maybe with some different tools in my toolbox than just, like, capes and masks and stuff. Well, that makes me excited, man, because I feel like that kind of goes in line a little bit with what Coke Mechanic does, which is there is a lot of relatable, like you said, there's a lot of relatable stuff, but there's some weird stuff in there, too, kind of blending the two. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, It's always got to be a little bit weird if I'm involved with it. <laughs> I think that that is, I think that that is a very good outlook to have on things. Um, well, let me ask you this before I let you go. There's a lot of people that have been listening to the show that keep hearing me talk about Flint and stuff. And obviously, I talked about my trip when I was there last time. But for people that come up to that part of Michigan that have never been there before, like, can you give us a few of those must-see destinations or must-go-to places? I mean, I've only been to Foster's Coffee Company and the Institute of Art. So for people that have never been to Flint before, like, how do you see the real Flint? Oh, man. Uh, other than... Uh those two which you just mentioned i would like to add on the flint farmers market is awesome uh there are tons of really really great places in there um if you're coming through flint they're open on tuesdays thursdays and saturdays i believe um but yeah you have a multitude of awesome food options uh just a lot of cool little shops there's like a wine store uh like a there's like a bar upstairs and stuff yeah it's just it's a really really nice really cool place um so definitely hit that up go catch a show with the flint local there's all sorts of cool stuff going on there all the time um and what else saw you buying bars great they throw shows there every now and then um good, good go sure. enroll in school go to <laughs> go to u of m flint <laughs> just have a few go get a four-year degree all right, and last thing, can you give us uh, the socials for the band or you or however you want people to stay in touch with Cope Naconic and Hope and all the things you have going on? Yeah, um, so uh, you can follow our band. Uh, Facebook is facebook.com slash Cope Naconic Band. We're on Twitter at Cope Naconic, also at Cope Naconic for Instagram. Uh, and then I'm on Twitter as um, Samsonite Moore, I believe. Man, I should. I mean, you, you know, it's the last time I lost episode. I don't <laughs> ever remember my Twitter handle. I should have been prepared. I'm pretty sure it's Sam Tonight Moore. Uh, same thing for Instagram as well. Mm. But yeah, we'll be we'll definitely be pushing the comic uh, for the months to come, and you can follow along with all that stuff there. 
That's great, man. And for people that keep wondering how you spell Copenhagenic, it's COP, C-O-P, N as in Nancy, as in Econic. <laughs> yes, that is exactly right. Um, <laughs> I think that you might have remembered how to spell that better than I could. So. <laughs> well, it, yeah. it is, it, it's, I think it's a cool name once you know how to spell it and how to say it. It's just when you sit, when you, it's almost like if you tried to ask someone to write the word Copenhagenic, they would be like, oh, C-O-P-E? in something it's just it's, yeah it's uh it's a word that your brain is like i don't know how how letters fit but that's fine it's a mess it's just a jumbled mess of letters it's, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine that's fine you did great man thank you so much for coming on the show um before we go i just want to remind people that hope a comic for flint is out now if you want even more about it you can go back one episode listen to 129 with jono uh, check out Copenhagenic. Their album is on Spotify and Bandcamp and all those services. And I'm sure when SYG is on the show in a couple of weeks, we'll brag about you some more when you're not here to talk about. And uh, <laughs> yeah, follow Sam online. He has funny tweets, even if he doesn't remember where he tweets from. So, so there you go. <laughs> yeah. I think that's good. All right, awesome. man. Thank you so much, James. No problem, dude. And do you mind if I uh, use a little Copenhagenic for the music in this episode? Oh, I would be so pissed off if you did that. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to probably use, I'm probably going to use my favorite part of that cloud song, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, so that's the fuzziness you hear in this episode of Sam's band. So if you want more of that, go seek them out. Thank you so much, Sam. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Yeah. Bye.